You know, I, I was actually surprised how, how many of the lessons I learned inside the military translated over. Quite often, at, at its core, most leadership is just about knowing your people, yeah. hearing your people, and taking care of them as best you can. I am a huge fan of leadership, and that's why I am so excited to bring you Simon Cardinal on this episode of Unbeatable. You're going to be blown away by what you hear from this very skilled leader. These stories of triumph over adversity will help you handle your toughest days in life and become unbeatable. Simon, it is great to have you on this episode of Unbeatable with me today. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Uh, I, I'm, I'm honored to be here. I appreciate you taking the time and tuning in and uh, joining me all the way from Ottawa, Canada. I'm in South Georgia right now. It's the middle of the summer, which means scorching heat and high humidity. I'm just going to guess that it's not quite as hot in Ottawa, Canada right now. Uh, you are right. We just got through a little bit of a heat wave. It was a, a, a whopping three days. And uh, it was 30 Celsius. Which oh, is, I, I can't goodness, even do the that's version. terrible. <laughs> 30 Celsius would be about 90 degrees Fahrenheit, um, which for you guys was probably rough, right? That's pretty rough. The The area we're in, uh, we don't get a lot. Like we get, we'll get it hovers around probably about 75, 80 most of the time. Uh -huh. But there's a lot of high humidity. And uh, for myself, uh, I'll, I'll take the I'll take the heat. Uh, it's the humidity that just sucks the life right out of me. Yeah. Well, then you don't want a vacation down in South Georgia where I'm broadcasting from today. That's basically what I'll tell you. Because <laughs> okay, you can cut the humidity with a butter knife. Wow. Yeah. yeah. yeah maybe we'll keep meeting over Zoom. Yeah, let's do that. <clears throat> hey, um, you and I have a couple of things in common. One, our passion for the military. Another, our passion for leadership. So this episode is just going to be some fun today. Um, you started off in the Canadian military back in 1994. Did you begin in the Canadian Army? Is that right? Yes, that's correct. So I started uh, when I was 19 years old. Uh, I was a, I'm okay with admitting it. I was a little punk. I thought I knew everything. I was 19. So did I. And yeah, you get it. When you're 19 and you're, it, it, if you're a stereotypical macho guy, I'm using finger quotations yeah. right now. I, I knew, I, I knew everything according to me. And uh, I started in the infantry in what uh, is called the Royal Canadian Regiment, Canada's oldest regular force regiment, uh, according to me, also the best regiment. Yes, of course. And uh, you know how it is, right? Your regiment's always uh -huh. the best. That's right. And uh, so I did that for five years and I loved it. I was deployed overseas. I was deployed uh, some some domestic type of things. And, uh, and after five years, I was, I was able to move into the air force, the Canadian air force. Yeah. What, what caused you to transition over to the Royal air force? Well, so I was going to say, the, tell me that it's the air conditioned, uh, you know, cockpits and the food in the dining facility, right in the, in the mess halls. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that was not part of it. Uh, when, when, uh, or tell you that it wasn't yeah. part of it because that was a lot of fun. Uh, you know, I was 24 when we, we used the term remustered. So mm -hmm. this, there's a program that exists that allows us to stay in the military and get retrained. Uh, I was, you know, 24, I was, you know, getting married. I was going to have kids. I, you know, you want, it's time to settle down because all of those fun, cool things that you do in the infantry, you do them day in and day yeah. out. It, it's the, the cool factor kind of starts to wear off. Yeah. And then it just and, becomes a lot of miserable hard work. Exactly. Exactly. And I, I remember a big exercise that we were doing and the, around this time, my back was starting to get sore, my knee, you get the idea. Uh -huh. And it was a, it was a very cold, cold, wet, long, miserable exercise. We we're out and we were happened to be working with a, a helicopter squadron and it was the middle of the night and we're actually up on this hill called day Hill. And it's if you can believe the middle it, of the night and you're on day Hill, I just want to make sure everybody's listening, catches that go for it. it Exactly, exactly. And on the top of the hill, we're digging into our trench and we can only go about a foot because there's slate underneath it and it's raining. So the, 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 the trench is filling up with water. Yeah. And so we're soaked. You get the idea. Uh -huh. it's, it's just miserable. So finally we get told, okay, index, index, index. We make our way back to the, the, the rear echelon and all the helicopter guys were complaining that the hot water in the showers wasn't quite hot enough <laughs> and that they were upset that they had to share rooms. So I remember thinking to myself that it, it, it might be time for me to go do something Maybe else. There's a different <laughs> standard of living in the Royal air force than in the infantry. Oh, very much so. Very much so. When did you meet this stunningly beautiful, um, warrior who eventually became your wife? Tell us about meeting Shelly. 
Oh, so I met Shelly when I was in the infantry. I was posted to a place called Gagetown in New Brunswick, Canada, which is just east of Ottawa. And she was going to university. It's a university city. And we met at a bar. It met through friends. And then we met again at a bar. And here we are. Flash forward yeah. a bunch of years. And 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 here we are. You know, yeah, the rest so is history, as y- they say. You spent a lot of time. Um, it, you didn't end your career uh, quickly. You spent a long time, 26 years before retiring from Uh, I'm using air quotes now, retiring from the Canadian military as a master warrant officer. But your wife, Shelly, is still serving. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. She's a supply technician or actually the term now, the name, the trade the trade, the name of the trade has changed to material maintenance technician. I can't remember now. It changes so often, Uh, but she's a supply technician basically. And she's a sergeant. So a senior non-commissioned member. She's everybody's favorite person because she's the person that can get them the stuff that they need everything and everyone revolves around the supply chain. Yeah, so there's a reason all why about, heck it's yeah. all about that. No, all about yeah. it. Um, like me, you had to have learned a little bit about leadership while you're in the military. So can you describe how your time in service helped shape your understanding of leadership? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I won't go all the way back to my first time, but I do need to kind of touch on my, my beginning in the military, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, Okay. Thank you. And so, if it takes so, too long, we'll just cut you off. Okay. That sounds like a great idea. And, <laughs> no, and I won't man, be offended. Go for it. <laughs> so uh, my first real taste of formal military leadership, I guess, would be when I was in basic training, like most of us. Yeah. And if, if I had to guess, you can probably still remember the name of your instructor, yep, your section definitely. commander. Yeah. Because, because that- Nobody ex- forgets that person. Exactly. The, inf- the level of influence that person brings to someone is astronomical. Mm-hmm. And- and I was very, very fortunate because my guy happened to be Master Corporal Smith was calm and cool and collected under all different kinds of pressures and stuff. Wow. And I remember thinking about that and the specific story that I, that I have, and I remember this, it stuck with, it still sticks with me was we were out in the field on basic training. It was a winter exercise and we're trying oh, to put up the 10 yeah. person tent. A mess. It's a, it's, it's, it's. <laughs> An interesting dance exactly. when everyone's fully trained. That's right. But when you've got 10 guys and it, happen, it happened to be 10 men in my section uh, and none of us knows what we're doing, it, it's it's comical. It's uh-huh. like watching the circus clowns. Yeah. So it happened to be that my role was to uh, light the, the Coleman stove in the lantern, which provides light and heat for the tent. I and know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And, and so it happened to be that because my dad was also in the military, we happened to have these things. So I was well-versed in starting these things. And so I was able to fortunately get these things lit quickly. So I'm off to the side and I'm watching my section mates running around and this tent is going up very, very slowly. Mm-hmm. And I'm actually, my hands are frozen because I, I I'm realizing it's, winter, that I'm it's not Canada it. and we can't figure out how to put a tent up. Exactly. So the master corporal looks at me and he says, Cardinal, if your hands are cold, you can put them over the flames. It's not your fault that they can't get the tent up. And when your job is, it's time to actually start getting these things inside the tent. You need to be able to do that properly. And, and that stuck with me. He just talked to me like I was a human being and he had, it was basic training. I don't know what yours was like, but in mine, there was an awful lot of swearing Uh and awful lot of push-ups. And that's pretty much true of everybody's basic training all over the world. Yeah, exactly. Right. And he had, he could have employed that. Like, listen, dumbass, get down and start yeah. doing push ups. That'll warm you up. How many times have you heard <laughs> That'll that? That'll warm your hands up. <laughs> exactly. And so that really stuck with me. And I tried to employ that type of uh, servant, humble leadership throughout my, my career, not even knowing that those names were attached to those types of things. So yeah. it's amazing how yeah. those little moments way back in 1994, have shaped me to the point I am today. Well, one of the questions I was looking forward to asking you, I get this question a lot. I'm just going to assume because of you as a leader and your connection to the Canadian military, you get this a lot, but how does some of those leadership lessons that you learned in the military, how well does that transition to guys and gals that have never served in the military and are never going to, in other words, how well does that military leadership that you learn transition outside of the military? You know, I I was actually surprised how how many of the lessons I learned inside the military translated over. Uh, just just the understanding of because some of the training we get in the Canadian military is when you get promoted to your first formal level of of uh, leadership, which is called master corporal, and you're you're in charge of a team of three to five people. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's when we start getting that formal leadership training, and 
the thing about it is I didn't really see the correlation between what I was getting 15 years ago to the being able to use it today. And, and all, quite often at, at its core, most leadership is just about knowing your people, yeah. hearing your people and taking care of them as best you can. Yeah. And, and, and I, I think the, one of the great things about the military, I think this will more clearly answer your question is we're really good at making sure that we t- give people the tools to formally go ahead and do that. Mm-hmm. Whereas what I've seen in the civilian sector, it's more about people's own experiences and what they've seen from leaders and taking their experiences and using and moving them forward. Yeah. It's just a different aspect. Yeah. I hope people are hearing you right now. The, the transferable principles that you learn in leadership in the military is know your people and take care of your people. And there's nowhere on earth that that doesn't work as a leader. It's, it's universal. Yeah. It really is. And the military is very good at, at making sure leaders are given the tools to know how to do that. Yeah. I had this moment in my career in the military uh, for a few years, my first few years in the U S army, I just had to take care of myself, my equipment and, and know my job. Then there was a point where I became a leader and my job became making sure that my men were taken care of. And for me, there was a kind of a challenging moment where I realized my focus is no longer me knowing my job. It's me making sure that my men know their job and they're taken care of. And honestly, that was a bit of a difficult moment for me. I had to get, a, I, it's a hurdle as a leader that I had to get over. And there was a very brief period of time where I thought, I don't, I don't know if I like being a leader. I like just taking care of me, not taking care of others. What about for you? When was the moment that you started to lead and you had to decide if you really liked leading or not? Well, so when I was first promoted to master corporal, this was way back in 2007 and uh, similar to you, the same idea. I was in charge of myself and making sure that I made my projects fixed. I yeah. fixed the airplane parts and I did it as best I could. And then all of a sudden I'm in charge of three people. And one of the things I've noticed in my podcast, one of the common themes is quite often people are promoted into leadership positions because they've proven themselves to be exceptionally skilled yeah. at the technical aspect of things. And the example I use all the time is so-and-so is the best welder in the, on the crew. So therefore they must be the best leader of all the welders on the crew. <laughs> Not necessarily, Not necessarily right? the same skill set, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I, my experiences have been that in, in you know, Western uh, society anyways, how do we gauge someone's ability to lead their skill set, their technical skill set. Yeah. And it's a, it's a hard crossover. So when that's exactly what happened to me, Simon, you're a great, you know, it happened to me. I was a welder and a painter. You're really great at those jobs. So we're going to put you in charge of those people. And all of a sudden personnel management, it was not necessarily oh, the thing for me. And I really had to ask myself if that was the case I wanted. And I was lucky. My, the two guys that I had working for me were really, really switched yeah. on, uh, very reliable, but still it's a big adjustment. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. A, it's a big step of responsibility, man. What you're describing right now, I have seen countless times in all walks of life, especially in the military. Um, and, it sounds like you and I have a couple of similarities because after getting over this hurdle and starting to lead other guys in the military, I started to learn to love leading and it became a passion for me. Even after leaving the military, I loved it. I read about it. I wanted to study it and you did too. So not only did you get formally trained as a leader in the Canadian military, but you decided to get a little bit more education and went to school to learn leadership. Tell us about that degree that you did at um, Royal Roads, Royal Roads University. Yeah. Thanks for that. So I actually, you're correct. I just graduated uh, with a master of arts in leadership and well, how I ended well, up congrats, that. man. Oh, thanks. Yeah. I, COVID was an interesting world to, to be doing a master's degree, but it was an interesting road for sure, but I, I'm, I'm very thankful I, I went along it because it's, it's honestly gotten to the point where you and I are speaking. Yeah. Um, I, so the thing about this degree is that I don't have an undergraduate degree. How you get accepted into this program is you write a resume, you give a copy of your, in my case, my military experience, you write an essay about why you want to get into this program. A board sits and they look at your personal and professional life and decide if, if they think that you wow. have what it takes to be in the program. Yeah. So I think that says something. And so away I went and it's a two year program. 
You um, totally skipped the undergraduate degree. I am so impressed, man. I'm blown away. You didn't just skip a grade in school. You skipped an entire degree. Good for you. Well, <laughs> I do appreciate that. To be totally honest, I they did say to me that I had to do a yeah. uh, an advanced writing course because I, I'm a really good military writer. Yeah, me but too. As one could imagine. Yeah. Oh, you go, you go. <laughs> I, I was just going to say, I am too. And when I turned my first papers in out of the military into a, an academic setting, they're like, this is a disaster. You have to fix this right away. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, they said something very similar to me. Um, one of the interesting things was that uh, as when I started the program, so I, I passed that first course, everything was great. And when I started the program, my, my uh, instructor, Maureen, Every time in my paper, she kept saying to me, Simon, this is great, but I need to see your heart in this. You, you, you have the technical aspects of this down. You understand what you're reading, but I want to see your heart in that. And that was a hard thing for me to yeah. do because the military is very much lead with your That's brain. Right. Yeah. You know? um, so that adjustment was, was quite, quite difficult for me. I'll be honest, after 20, at that time, 23 years in the military, it was, it was challenging. So to be able to do that and switch it over was tough. But when I was open my mind to that, to the, to the advantages of leading with your heart, uh, I was that, that it completely changed how I was doing everything, not just the learning and how I attacked it, but how I was leading because I was still in the military at the yeah. time. And uh, what I ultimately ended up doing was finding a pendulum where something worked in the middle for me. Yeah. Um, I, I struggle with the same thing. Um, writing, there is a very specific way of writing military correspondence and a very, very specific way of writing in the academic world. And those two have nothing in common. So I almost had to relearn everything that I knew about writing official correspondence when I left the military. Oh, I, I, I went through the exact same thing. I remember when I started with the new job because something's got to pay the bills. Yeah. And I was sending out emails and I, I, I knew I needed to tone things down. So I would send the email like a uh, good day. I require the following things. Thank you very much. And have a good day. I love it. Kind as regards yeah. to Simon Cardinal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, after yeah. about two weeks of that, my boss calls me up and he's like, Simon, listen, uh, uh, you, you got to tone down your emails. Like you got to make them a little more pleasant. I'm like, what do you mean? I said to have a good day. Right. Yeah. Like <laughs> it doesn't matter what else I said. I put have a good day in there. That's pleasant. Right. Yeah. 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 Exactly. My and wife like, said yeah. the exact same words to me, like Jeff, you can't send that off. This isn't the military. They're, you're going to offend people with that kind of language. And I'm like, I'm just saying what. I guess you don't. Whatever. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I totally I could, get it. I could I totally spend get an it. hour on this subject, but we're not going to. Um, <laughs> by now, anybody who's been listening to this episode has heard the word leadership like 400 times, and we're going to keep talking about it because. Like you, Simon, I'm a bit of a leadership nerd. And really, I'm not so much passionate about leadership. I'm just fascinated by people and what makes people tick. And when I, um, I, I did a little bit of advanced education in leadership as well, because I just wanted to know what prompts people to do amazing things, challenging things, dangerous things. How do you motivate people to do that? And ultimately, it comes down to leadership. So you have so. taken um, your experiences and your education, and now you're helping not just Canada, but you're helping the masses by launching Trench Leadership Podcast, which, by the way, in less than 50 episodes, has climbed the charts and gone up to the top 20 in Canadian podcast in this subject. So what was the original reason for launching Trench Leadership? Well, the original reason was when I was getting near the end of my, my master's degree, I'm sitting around. I, now I have all of this, this graduate level information sitting around in my mind. And I started asking myself, well, what am I going to do with this? Like, how can I, what's the next step? Uh, and how can I get this out there? And one of the, one of the thoughts that kept coming back to me as I was going through the program was, gee, I sure wish I'd heard about systems thinking back when I was right. a new master corporal mm -hmm. or the great man theory or Trans, transactional versus transformational leadership. I'm not suggesting as a brand new team leader, you need a graduate level of understanding, but at least understanding that these things exist to know where to go find it, that would have been invaluable yeah. because when I was getting these inf this information, I was a master warrant officer considered to be a strategic slash institutional level leader. And my main role was changing from taking care of people, which was still important, but more to advising commanders on how they can yeah. take care of their people. 
So I, and I was, I wasn't ready for it. Um, and so how can I get that information out? Next thing you know, I came up with the idea for the podcast and, and here we are. Yeah. And by the way, man, I've just scrolled through some of the episodes, just looking at your guests and reading the titles. You have a lot of very helpful information on your, um, in your podcast. So the title of the podcast, for those of you who are driving your car right now and missed it was trench leadership, a podcast from the front. And, um, Simon Cardinal is the host of that podcast. Simon, um, I learned there was first for me a leadership challenge going from just figuring out how to do my job and and make sure that I was in the right place doing the right thing at the right time to leading others and making sure that they were in the right place at the right time. I call that local leadership or tactical level leadership. Now, you and I both know that in the military, tactical has very specific mission. Uh, it's a very specific mission language. So I'm going to take a step away from the military level here and just talk to our listeners about leading at the local level, meaning you, your, yourself, and two or three other people that report directly to you. There's a skill set that it takes to lead at the local level. I want you to talk about that in just a second. But then... Often when people lead well in a small team setting, two or three, three to five people, then the big bosses start to say, well, I wonder if they can lead at the next level. And this is what I'd like to refer to as the strategic level or when you start to lead teams of people, which inevitably means now you're leading leaders. Can you tell the listeners, I'm just going to uh, clear the way and let you talk for a few minutes. Tell the listeners what it looks like to lead at the local level, meaning you got a team of three or four people that work for you, and then the transition to leading at the strategic level or leading leaders. Would you talk about that for just a few minutes? Yeah, I'd love to. Thanks for the opportunity. So when, uh, and this is actually really great because trench leadership is meant to speak to emerging leaders at mm -hmm. that three to five level. Because as we kind of talked about a little bit earlier, more often than not, people are brought into those roles because of their technical right. skill set. And what happens? There's usually a whole bunch of imposter syndrome kicks in or, or it's the other way. Like I am, I've been waiting for this opportunity for years and I am amazing and I'm going to be the best leader ever. Yeah. Probably not. Right. Like the, the reality of it is we're, we're starting in a new phase of our careers. Yeah. So there's going to be mistakes. Do me a favor, define imposter syndrome. I know what it is, but for the people that are listening, tell them everybody, give them a real short definition of this. Absolutely. So the best thing I could say is imposter syndrome is when you have convinced yourself that you're not good enough. Yeah. You don't deserve to be there for whatever reason is. And more often than not, it's not warranted. When I started this, uh, that master's degree, uh, I, I remember going to a, the first residency portion and I had convinced myself so much that I did not deserve to be there because I, I didn't have an undergraduate degree. I was the only person in the military, all these different things. And I, I, I stressed myself out so bad. I actually made myself sick, like physically yeah. ill. Wow. Uh, I got the common cold because of it just, and it, it's, it's more often than not, that's just what happens. Yeah. A lot of us look at the unknown and we start to decide all the reasons why we're not going to be successful. And then those reasons start to become self-fulfilling because we focus so much on that. So, um, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. You were talking about leading at the local level or leading at small team of three to five. Yeah. Oh, no trouble at all. So, so the big thing is when these, these leaders are taking over at that tactical or local level, the big thing to remember is that you're going to make mistakes. That, that is just the way it is. You're never, ever going to stop making mistakes regardless of the level that you're at, but you were selected to go into that role for a reason. Someone saw something in you to go into that job and, and, and lead people. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter why, but you are able to go and do this. And if you're not sure if you are, go listen to podcasts, go read books. There's all kinds of information out there. That's the great thing about the internet. The information is available. So go and find it. And if you're not sure, talk to your friends, ask your boss why you were put into that role. That's okay. And remember that when you're making those mistakes, that's also okay. There's not an expectation for people to be perfect. Just, you know, learn from it. And also I'd like to point out, Negligence is different than a mistake. I yeah. can't stress that enough. Yeah, please. Right. Uh, let's talk about that for just a second. There's a difference between making a mistake and just not doing what you know you sh or what you know you're supposed to be doing. It, exactly. You know, quite often uh, we've I'm sure we've all seen it where someone didn't want to admit they didn't know how to do something, so they just didn't do it. 
that that's a significant problem in the military operational world. It can cost lives and yeah. in a for-profit organization, it could cost money. And at the end of the day, that could cost jobs. So if you don't know, just admit it. No one is expecting the, the tactical leader to be infallible. Okay, that takes a lot of courage. If we're honest, you're that new leader and you had somebody who you really respect. They, you look up to them. They have put a little bit of trust in you and they've said, Simon, I think you're a great welder. I think what you, you have what it takes to lead other welders. And you want to impress, not just impress, but you, you look up to this person. So you want to do your best for them. But deep inside, you know, man, there's some things that I don't know. And I'm also making some mistakes and the, I I hate to use this phrase, but the shallow or the small person is going to do their best to cover their mistakes up and make it look Mm -hmm. like they never happened, or they won't admit that they don't know it all. So I think I need your help right now to just talk to the listeners that are scared to admit it. Everybody knows that you don't know it all, but you don't want to say it out loud. So how do I get to the point where I feel comfortable enough that I can say, Hey boss, I made a mistake or, Hey, you guys, I don't, I'm not exactly sure, uh, you know, what's the next best plan, but I'm working on it. Well, and you're absolutely right. I know earlier I said, just, just admit it, but it's never that simple because more often than not, uh, at the tactical level, we are putting a lot of pressure on ourselves to perform because we're like, Oh, this is my first chance. I really need to prove myself and making mistakes means that I I'm not capable there's honestly, I don't think there's any easy way to, to get around it, but people need to do a gut check. They need to be brave and, and just honestly, just talk about it. Say, I don't know what's going on right now. I, I, I need some help. It's not easy. Uh, but I think that's also part of being a leader is admitting when we don't know something yeah. so that we can all learn and we can keep going forward. Uh, I wish there was a magic pill that would work it out, but there isn't. When I think back to the greatest leaders that I ever had the privilege of working for, every one of them had moments where they said, I don't know, or I've messed up. The guys or gals that I worked with that never made those statements, they were okay at best as a leader. Most of them were actually pretty terrible leaders. Because all of us make mistakes. It's 100% guaranteed that you're going to make a mistake because we're all imperfect. And no leader knows it all, all the time. All of us experience those moments where I'm like, I'm not exactly sure what to do next. And I got some work to do to figure it out. So Uh I, I hope if you're the local level leader, if you're leading this small team, and you're really wrestling with admitting out loud, I don't know, or I've made some mistakes. I hope you'll hear from Simon. Your boss believes in you, or they wouldn't have put you in this role, but your boss doesn't believe you can walk on water. So it's okay to admit to your team. It's even okay to admit to your boss, I don't know. What's not okay is to cover it up or not to do something about what you don't know. Well, very much so. Uh, and, and one of the things with this is understanding that, that these mistakes are going to happen. And when you make the mistake, your your team, what they're really looking for, it for and they want to see is that you're willing to learn from it. Yeah. So making the same mistake time and time again is a problem. But yeah. if you make an error and you just you, you, you admit it and you, you all learn from it and grow from it, that's what all people want to see. They just that we're going to you know, grow from it. Yeah. Probably the most valuable moments of a leader's career are the mistakes that they've made and learning and growing from those mistakes. If you never made mistakes, you don't really grow like those painful mistake moments that force you to grow. I think there's a, there's a big jump between being a welder and just taking care of yourself, being the guy like I was in the military who just had to focus on me and then starting to lead at the local level. That's a really big jump. And some people are, they really struggle with that jump. But then what I found is that if you start to lead really, really well at the local level, then the big bosses start to look at that. They start to see the performance and they start to say, man, maybe Simon can start to lead at the strategic level. Maybe Simon's ready to start to lead leaders. And I found that the leader in that situation kind of thinks, oh, it's no big deal. I'll just keep doing what I was doing with the team. I'll just do it at a bigger level. And what they didn't, they don't appreciate, I didn't appreciate this, is just how huge of a jump it is to go from leading people to leading people who are leading people. In other words, going to lead leaders. 
So now, would you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the big things is that when you're making that transition is to acknowledge that the transition is happening. Because I know myself, when I was brought into those roles, I, I was still thinking like I was at the tactical level. I made the same mistakes mm-hmm. that you were just talking about. I would, I would, uh, one of the most notable things in my mind, one of the errors that I made was I, when I was a sergeant, so now I'm a senior non-commissioned member and I have people that are that leaders that I'm in charge of. And I'm talking to them the exact same way I would be talking to a brand new private yeah. or a, a corporal or whatnot in the military. And it's not, it's a, diff, a totally different mm-hmm. dynamic. And it took me a while to realize that. And the other thing that I, I had took me a while to clue into was that leaders are always being judged on their actions, their movements, what they say, how they're standing when they're saying something. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's true when you're a brand new emerging leader, but I find it's even more true when you're a leader talking to other leaders. And the example I like to use is I'm one of these type of people. I like to stand with my hands on my hips and kind of square my shoulders and my, and my, and my, my feet. Um, and I, and I knew that in myself, it's not because I'm trying to project that I'm looking yeah. at me. I'm the, I'm the amazing, uh, just, just how I, I'm comfortable. Uh, and then one day I was teaching basic training and one of my masters, I was talking to all the master corporals and one of the guys, very brave master corporal came up to me and said, Hey, Simon, uh, listen at air force, right? So everything's yeah. first names. Uh, <laughs> so, Hey Simon, listen, um, you're, you're kind of coming off like a dick. I hope I can say that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Like, and I'm like, well, what do you mean? Like, I was just talking the briefing. Oh, sorry, you go. No, I was going to say, you got your hands on your hips like Superman and you're standing up in front of them with your legs spread apart and everybody's like, who is this guy? Yeah, I, I, like I, I was coming off like like I was super arrogant, like yeah. I was the be all end all. And all I'm thinking is this is just, it's comfortable for yeah. me because I have some lower back issues. <laughs> but if you don't tell people these things, they're going to make a story yeah. up. And 99% yeah. of the time, it's not something that's uh, that's a positive thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I hope you're, if you're uh, driving around, listening to this podcast and you have now found yourself going from just taking care of yourself at work to now taking care of others and leading that small team, you're hearing from Simon, you got some work to do. You got some learning to do. You got some growing to do, to be able to lead that small team. But I also hope that if you're the person that is now transitioning into leading leaders, it is just as big of a jump to go from leading a small team, tactical level leader, to being a strategic level leader and starting to lead a team of leaders. Because as Simon just pointed out, man, your language has to change. Your posture has to change. Almost everything about the way that you lead may have to change because you're leading different people at a very different level now. And I didn't realize that right away. I had a couple of painful lessons that I had to learn in order to be effective at leading leaders. Um, I know you've done in the Canadian military or in school or now leading this podcast. Um, I know you've been in some tough leadership assignments. I've been in a couple of tough leadership roles a time or two. But I'm a, I'm a guy who's just totally fascinated by the guy or the gal that's in a tough situation and leads really well. So, Simon, I got this high five segment I want us to do. Because I, I sit back and I watch leadership in all walks of life, in all segments of society. And I see some people that are just blowing me away by how well they're leading in very challenging times. And I want to ask you to tell the audience what you think maybe the top five hardest leadership roles are in any walk of life. I've got five uh, little roles here that I think are probably the most challenging things that a leader will ever do. Um, And I'll, in fact, I'll kick it off and we'll just bounce back and forth. Does that sound okay? Yeah, that would be fantastic. Let's do this. Um, For me, number five on this list is the local level elected official. And the reason I say local is because when you start to get to the mid-level or the national level, it's a lot harder for your constituents to see you, to talk to you, to complain to you. But when you're that local level elected official, they're in the grocery store next to you. They're at the restaurant. They see you at church. And they like to tell you every time you did something wrong. Occasionally, they may pat you on the back for doing something right. 
but they're going to tell you every time you did something wrong. And it occurs to me, it's really, really hard to stick to your guns when you know I'm going to hear this 10,000 times in the grocery store and at the gas station if I make this decision, but I still think it's the right decision to do. So for me, that's number five on my list. What would you say is a tough leadership assignment? Well, oh, I think a, a tough leadership assignment would be the the assistant manager at a restaurant because oh, when someone's yeah. complaining, yeah, right? And it's when someone's complaining and someone is always complaining, you know, the employee's going to you, well, what do I do? Do I comp this this meal? Do I do this? Do you, are they, you know, it, it's tough. It's you you always want to make everyone happy, but at the same token, it's it's still a business. So where do you draw that line? Yeah. And it's nonstop. Yeah, that's so true because nobody comes up and tells you, hey, you did a great job. My food was perfect. They only tell you when something was like 1% wrong, they forgot about the 99% of right that you did today. Which kind of brings me to number four on my list because for me, number four on the list is that local sports coach. And by that, I mean, whatever sport is huge in your community, maybe it's hockey in Canada, in Ottawa, maybe it's high school football, where I'm from, that local coach, everybody has an opinion about how he or that coach is supposed to do their job. And not only does everybody have an opinion, but everybody complains and criticizes, even when you do well, like you won the big game, but they're not happy because you didn't go undefeated the whole season when in the big game. And it's like, there is no way that any human being could possibly please everybody in that role. So for me, that local coach is number four on my list. What about you? So coincidentally, number four for me was, was the quarterback on a team. Oh, look at that. And, uh, so it's meant to be, it's perfect. Uh, I'm a huge Canadian football league fan and it's nice and easy to follow. Nice. There's nine teams. It's great. I'm actually going to a game tonight. All right. Um, and, and my team, uh, the Winnipeg blue bombers, not my team specifically. I'm a I was going to say you team. own the Winnipeg uh, blue bombers. Yeah, I'm kind of a big deal in yeah, my head. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, they're back to back Grey Cup champions. So that's our version of the Super Bowl. Yeah. And uh, the quarterback, Zach Kolaros, he's bounced around a few different teams in the league. And he was basically written off because of a concussion that had happened a few years back. Went to another team, never actually played because he was recovering from the concussion. And then Winnipeg's quarterback got injured. So they brought Zach in and they brought him in with just a couple of games left in the season. Anyways, they end up winning the Grey Cup that year. And then COVID happened. They won wow. the Grey Cup last year, yeah. and they're undefeated. They're zero and three, or sorry, three and zero this year. So the guy has a record of twenty wins and two losses, and it is just as easy to find people critiquing this person. Good gracious! Uh, yeah. For the two losses, yeah. how about that? As is as, as for the fact that, yeah. yeah, exactly. So it doesn't matter. Sorry, I didn't yeah. mean that. Ram no, there, I totally, no, I totally get it. It's it's crazy how sports fans are. Like, hey, you didn't win by enough. Yeah, you won, but it wasn't by enough. Or yeah, you won the big game, but you didn't go undefeated all season. It's like, man, come on. Um, yeah, it, it's crazy. All right, so number three on my list is the number two person in an organization. Now, I'm just going to give the listeners a hint. None of these on my list are inherently military roles. They're just any walk of life roles. And the two I see, the second in charge, the number two person in an organization, I think has probably the more difficult job than the number one person. Because the number one guy or gal, you know, they have the formal authority, they have the responsibility, but there's usually a level of buffer between them and everybody else in the organization. So yeah, you have to make some really hard decisions as the number one person. But the number two person not only has to live with those decisions, but usually everybody else in the organization goes to the number two and says, hey, I need you to tell the number one that they're a moron and we hate them which makes the number two's job so hard. What about you? So I mean, tell me your thoughts on a leader, a tough leadership gig here. Oh yeah. So I, first of all, I've got to say, I completely agree. That second in command, the two IC role is the toughest one. It, it's, it's coincidentally my number two, which works out very right. well. Um, and it would, what a surprise, a couple of military yeah. guys had to find something uh -huh. in there. And, and the reason I put it as my number two, but then I'll get, which leads me to my number three. Okay. Uh, is that there is an expectation that the 2IC is supposed to be the expert in the role that they've right. got, but also able to fill into right. the IC yeah. role. 
and and find and bridge that gap. It's it's tough because you're still trying to just do your job, but also know how to do the next yeah. level up. It's yeah. challenging. Yeah, and Painless. everybody in the world thinks you're the reason. You're the one that needs to go fix the number one guy or the number one gal, and that's not your job. Your job is to do the number two role and to do it with the best of your ability. Now, of course, protect the number one from making some really bad mistakes, but um, yeah, it just, okay. So now tell us what would be number three on your list since I just stole number two from you. Oh, that's all good. I'm, I'm happy with that happened. Uh, so my number three is the friendly neighbor. Uh, I don't know about the area that you live in, but all of us, we all seem to get along really well. And the, fr- yeah, the friendly neighbors and we, you know, in the winter, we mm-hmm. help each other with, with clearing our driveways and those types of things. Ottawa gets quite a bit of snow and there's, there's always the one friendly neighbor that's, that's, that's bending over backwards. I've seen it in the many different places I've lived. And what always seems to happen is that person, there's always one grumpy neighbor that's complaining about this person that's helping everyone out. <laughs> and so this neighbor's helping, you know, keep the morale high in the area. We're all doing our different things. And then someone's complaining, calling the bylaw yeah. office or whatever it is. And it's a tough, you just, you just want to be a nice person and respect each other and live your life. And yet there's always someone that has something to complain about. I'm laughing out loud that there is a neighbor who is such a jerk that they want to complain about the neighbor that is bending over backwards to help everybody else out. But yep, everybody has a neighbor like that. You know, we don't get that kind of snow in South Georgia, so we don't have friendly neighbors down here. Everybody can just be a jerk to everybody else because nobody has to help with snow. Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you. Ottawa set a record for the, for the amount of snow last year. We had, we, they stopped counting at 350 oh centimeters, which is like, I'm like, that's crazy. Yeah. It's like two and a half feet. Some yeah, crazy I was going to say like for that. those of you who it's don't nuts. recognize the, the metric system, that's an insane amount of snow. Um, number yeah. two on my <laughs> list is going to be the stay at home parent, mom or dad. Um, and the reason why is self evident. Your never off work. You never get a break from the moment that you actually, even when you're asleep, they wake you up and you're at work. And if, and of course you're taking care of your children and you love your children, but it's relentless, never a moment where you can take a break, which means if you ever lose your cool, if you ever let your guard down, if you ever, you know, just snap, it's because there's no one there to, you know, relieve stress or to give you a break. And that for me is probably the second hardest leadership role I can imagine out there. Um, what's number one on your list? Well, number one on my list is, uh, honestly, it's the emerging leader because okay. it, it, it comes across all different professions. And I know that's, it's kind of sound, might sound a little kind of trite because my, my podcast is meant to talk to emerging leaders, but that's not why I spoke to this. This point is my number one. It speaks to all the people out there that are in, have some type of leadership role, be it formal or informal. We're all trying to figure it out. And then when you're having to make that leap into actually being in charge of folks and having to to step into that role, it is overwhelming as much as we've, and quite often, I think when people realize they're, uh, they're prepared, they're not quite as prepared for it as they they might think they are. Yeah. Uh, I absolutely agree. You can tell people in uh, the future episodes of trench leadership that for me, that was a traumatic moment in my military career because I just didn't know how hard that was going to be until I got into it. And I, it was so hard that there was a moment where I thought, maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I just need to go back to doing my own thing. Uh, eventually, I learned to love it. But man, it was a really, really hard moment for me as a leader. Um, number well, one on my list. for me. And this is, um, maybe people don't think about it in these terms, but I really hope you will. Number one on my list, by far, by a long shot, is learning how to lead yourself. The hardest person mm-hmm. that I have ever tried to lead by far is myself because I know myself. I know what I'm capable of. I know when I'm not delivering my best. When I let myself down, it is far more disappointing than the people that I lead when they let me down. By, for me, hands down, the hardest thing a leader will ever do is leading themselves. And if you can lead yourself well, even be willing to admit that I've made some mistakes or I don't know it all. If you can do that, then chances are you're ready to lead other people well. That's number one on my oh. list. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I wish I could go back and take that too yeah. because that is that is huge. It is so hard. We tend to be so hard on ourselves 
and and to be kind to ourselves when we make these mistakes and move, move into these roles, it's difficult to do. We have a yeah. tendency to focus on the negative aspects. I of am by far my worst critic. And when I drive home after a long day, I only remember the times that I didn't accomplish or didn't do what I thought I was capable of. I don't think about the other times that I, that I did what I was hoping or, or even exceeded it. So, um, Simon, let's wrap this thing up by talking about where trench leadership is now and uh, give everybody an idea of what the future, the next couple of episodes of trench leadership look like just for people that are out there looking for an awesome podcast on what it looks like to lead from the front. Great. Well, thanks so much for that. So yeah, trench leadership, a podcast from the front is available wherever you want to find your podcast shows. I'm on all the different major, uh, major series and some of the not so popular ones. So it works out very well. Uh, what we're doing right now, I'm in episode 47 and for the next few episodes, what I've been doing or the last few episodes rather, and the next few upcoming episodes is I've been running a kind of mini series that talks about all the, the various strength-based uh, assessments that are kind of floating around out there. We've already talked about Clifton strengths. Uh, we've got, uh, we've talked about Enneagram. I've mm-hmm. got something, the, la- the latest episode talks about how, doing a DNA check and seeing what your DNA says about your leadership styles and how you might be able to All improve right. on that. Yeah. Yeah. Up next will be DISC and then the MBTI. And then I can't believe it. It's going to be one year of the show. And so I've got a couple of special episodes coming in with some cool guests and I'm looking forward to that. Pop the champagne. You're almost a year old. Congratulations. Way to go, Simon. I can't believe it's blowing my mind away. And not just a year of episodes, but a very successful first year. Like I said, everybody, Trench Leadership is now a top 20 Canadian leadership podcast. And if you're just looking for some good skills to lead or to lead better, please check out Trench Leadership. Simon, thank you so much for being with me on this episode, man. Oh, thanks so much. It's been a real pleasure to be here speaking with you. This has been a lot of fun. All right. We'll see you around. There's a statement that Simon just made that's going to be rumbling around with me all week long. He said, don't be afraid to admit your mistakes. Don't be afraid to say when you don't know the answer. And for a lot of people, myself included, that's a really, really hard thing to do. But when you start to become comfortable enough with your inadequacies, with your mistakes and with your inadequacies that you can admit it, now you're on the road to becoming a great leader. I hope you learned as much from Simon as I did in this episode of Unbeatable. Hey guys, if you found us for the first time and you're just tuning in for your very first episode, thanks for joining us today. Did you know that we're all over social media? You can find us pretty much anywhere by just simply searching for at unbeatable podcast. And if you've been listening for a while and you really like what you're hearing, why don't you go ahead and follow us on your favorite podcast platform or subscribe to us? Hey, newsflash, we just started broadcasting on iHeartRadio and already people are finding us and following us on iHeartRadio as well. Just give us a rating. Tell everybody else what you thought about this podcast. And if you are wanting to learn more about leadership, I got the perfect resource for you and it's totally free. I developed the survival guide, the unbeatable army survival guide. It's completely free. It's a PDF download. And all you got to do to get it is go to unbeatablearmy.com. Thanks for joining me this episode. I'll see you right back here next week.